The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What ho! What ho! This fellow is dancing mad. He hath been bitten by the tarantula. Excerpted from All in the Wrong. Many years ago, I contracted an intimacy with a Mr. William Legrand. He was of an ancient Huguenot family, and had once been wealthy, but a series of misfortunes had reduced him to want. To avoid the mortification consequent upon his disasters, he left New Orleans, the city of his forefathers, and took up his residence at Sullivan's Island, near Charleston, South Carolina. This island is a very singular one. It consists of little else than the sea sand, and is about three miles long. Its breadth at no point exceeds a quarter of a mile. It is separated from the mainland by a scarcely perceptible creek, oozing its way through a wilderness of reeds and slime, a favorite resort of the marsh hen. The vegetation, as might be supposed, is scant, or at least dwarfish. No trees of any magnitude are to be seen. Near the western extremity, where Fort Moultrie stands, and where are some miserable frame buildings, tenanted, during summer, by the fugitives from Charleston dust and fever, may be found, indeed, the bristly palmetto. But the whole island, with the exception of this western point, and a line of hard, white beach on the sea coast, is covered with a dense undergrowth of the sweet myrtle, so much prized by the horticulturists of England. The shrub here often attains the height of fifteen or twenty feet, and forms an almost impenetrable coppice, burthening the air with its fragrance. In the inmost recesses of this coppice, not far from the eastern or more remote end of the island, Legrand had built himself a small hut, which he occupied when I first, by mere accident, made his acquaintance. This soon ripened into friendship, for there was much in the recluse to excite interest and esteem. I found him well educated, with unusual powers of mind, but infected with misanthropy, and subject to perverse moods of alternate enthusiasm and melancholy. He had with him many books, but rarely employed them. His chief amusements were gunning and fishing, or sauntering along the beach and through the myrtles in quest of shells or entomological specimens. His collection of the latter might have been envied by a Svamardam. In these excursions he was usually accompanied by an old negro, called Jupiter, who had been manumitted before the reverses of the family, but who could be induced, neither by threats nor by promises, to abandon what he considered his right of attendance upon the footsteps of his young Massa Will. It is not improbable that the relatives of Legrand, conceiving him to be somewhat unsettled in intellect, had contrived to instill this obstinacy into Jupiter, with a view to the supervision and guardianship of the wanderer. The winters in the latitude of Sullivan's Island are seldom very severe, and in the fall of the year it is a rare event indeed when a fire is considered necessary. About the middle of October, 18, there occurred, however, a day of remarkable chilliness. Just before sunset, I scrambled my way through the evergreens to the hut of my friend, whom I had not visited for several weeks, my residence being, at that time, in Charleston, a distance of nine miles from the island, while the facilities of passage and repassage were very far behind those of the present day. Upon reaching the hut I rapped, as was my custom, and getting no reply, sought for the key where I knew it was secreted, unlocked the door, and went in. A fine fire was blazing upon the hearth. It was a novelty, and by no means an ungrateful one. I threw off an overcoat, took an armchair by the crackling logs, and awaited patiently the arrival of my hosts. Soon after dark they arrived, and gave me a most cordial welcome. Jupiter, grinning from ear to ear, bustled about to prepare some marsh hens for supper. Legrand was in one of his fits, how else shall I term them, of enthusiasm. He had found an unknown bivalve, forming a new genus, and more than this, he had hunted down and secured, with Jupiter's assistance, a scarabaeus which he believed to be totally new, but in respect to which he wished to have my opinion on the morrow. And why not tonight? I asked, rubbing my hands over the blaze, and wishing the whole tribe of scarabii at the devil. Ah, if only I had known you were here, said Legrand. 
but it's so long since I saw you, and how could I foresee that you would pay me a visit this very night of all others? As I was coming home, I met Lieutenant G from the fort, and very foolishly I lent him the bug, so it will be impossible for you to see it until the morning. Stay here tonight, and I will send Jupe down for it at sunrise. It is the loveliest thing in creation. What? Sunrise? Nonsense! No, the bug! It is of a brilliant gold color, about the size of a large hickory nut, with two jet black spots near one extremity of the back, and another, somewhat longer, at the other. The antennae are... They ain't no tin in him, Massa Will. I keep a tellin' on you, here interrupted Jupiter. De bug is a gold bug, solid, every bit of him, inside and all, sep him wing. Never feel half so heavy a bug in my life. Well, suppose it is, Jupe, replied Legrand, somewhat more earnestly, it seemed to me, than the case demanded. Is that any reason for your letting the birds burn? The color, here he turned to me, is really almost enough to warrant Jupiter's idea. You never saw a more brilliant metallic luster than the scales emit, but of this you cannot judge till tomorrow. In the meantime, I can give you some idea of the shape. Saying this, he seated himself at a small table, on which were a pen and ink, but no paper. He looked for some in a drawer, but found none. Never mind, he said at length, this will answer. And he drew from his waistcoat pocket a scrap of what I took to be a very dirty fool's cap, and made upon it a rough drawing with a pen. While he did this, I retained my seat by the fire, for I was still chilly. When the design was complete, he handed it to me without rising. As I received it, a loud growl was heard, succeeded by a scratching at the door. Jupiter opened it, and a large Newfoundland, belonging to Legrand, rushed in, leaped upon my shoulders, and loaded me with caresses, for I had shown him much attention during previous visits. When his gambols were over, I looked at the paper, and, to speak the truth, found myself not a little puzzled at what my friend had depicted. Well, I said, after contemplating it for some minutes, this is a strange scarabaeus, I must confess. New to me. Never saw anything like it before. Unless it was a skull, or a death's head, which it more nearly resembles than anything else that has come under my observation. A death's head? echoed Legrand. Oh, yes, well, it has something of that appearance upon paper, no doubt. The two upper black spots look like eyes, eh? and the longer one at the bottom like a mouth, and then the shape of the whole is oval. Perhaps so, said I. But, Legrand, I fear you are no artist. I must wait until I see the beetle itself, if I am to form any idea of its personal appearance. Well, I don't know, said he, a little nettled. I draw tolerably. Should do it, at least. Have had good masters, and flatter myself that I am not quite a blockhead. "'But, my dear fellow, you are joking, then,' said I. "'This is a very passable skull. "'Indeed, I may say that it is a very excellent skull, "'according to the vulgar notions about such specimens of physiology. "'And your scarabaeus must be the queerest scarabaeus in the world "'if it resembles it. "'Why, we may get up a very thrilling bit of superstition upon this hint. "'I presume you will call the bug Scarabaeus Caput Hominis, or something of that kind.' There are many similar titles in the natural histories. But where are the antennae you spoke of? The antennae, said Legrand, who seemed to be getting unaccountably warm upon the subject. I am sure you must see the antennae. I made them as distinct as they are in the original insect, and I presume that is sufficient. Well, well, I said, perhaps you have. Still, I don't see them. And I handed him the paper without additional remark, not wishing to ruffle his temper but I was much surprised at the turn affairs had taken. His ill humor puzzled me, and, as for the drawing of the beetle, there were positively no antennae visible, and the whole did bear a very close resemblance to the ordinary cuts of a death's head. He received the paper very peevishly, and was about to crumple it, apparently to throw it in the fire, when a casual glance at the design seemed suddenly to rivet his attention. In an instant his face grew violently red, in another as excessively pale. For some minutes he continued to scrutinize the drawing minutely where he sat. At length he arose, took a candle from the table, 
and proceeded to seat himself upon a sea-chest in the farthest corner of the room. Here again he made an anxious examination of the paper, turning it in all directions. He said nothing, however, and his conduct greatly astonished me, yet I thought it prudent not to exacerbate the growing moodiness of his temper by any comment. Presently he took from his coat pocket a wallet, placed the paper carefully in it, and deposited both in a writing desk, which he locked. He now grew more composed in his demeanor, but his original air of enthusiasm had quite disappeared. Yet he seemed not so much sulky as abstracted. As the evening wore away, he became more and more absorbed in reverie, from which no sallies of mine could arouse him. It had been my intention to pass the night at the hut, as I had frequently done before, but, seeing my host in this mood, I deemed it proper to take leave. He did not press me to remain, but, as I departed, he shook my hand with even more than his usual cordiality. It was about a month after this, and during the interval I had seen nothing of Legrand, when I received a visit, at Charleston, from his man Jupiter. I had never seen the good old negro look so dispirited, and I feared that some serious disaster had befallen my friend. "'Well, Jupe,' said I, "'what is the matter now? How is your master?' "'Why, to speak the truth, Massa, him not so very well as mought be. "'Not well? I am truly sorry to hear it. "'What does he complain of?' "'Dar, that's it. "'Him never plain o' nothing, "'but him very sick for all that.' "'Very sick, Jupiter. "'Why didn't you say so at once? "'Is he confined to bed?' "'No, Daddy ain't. "'He ain't fine nowhere. "'That's just where the shoe pinch.' My mind is got to bury heavy about poor Massa Will. Jupiter, I should like to understand what it is you are talking about. You say your master is sick. Hasn't he told you what ails him? Why, Massa, tain't worth while for to get mad about the matter. Massa Will say nothing at all ain't the matter with him. But then what make him go about looking dis here way, with his head down and his shoulders up, and as white as a ghost? And then he keep a siphon all the time. Keeps a what, Jupiter? Keeps a siphon with the figures on the slate. The queerest figures I ever did see. It's getting me scared, I tell you. Have for to keep mighty tight eye upon him, Nubers. T'other day, he give me the slip for the sun up and was gone to hull of the blessed day. I had a big stick ready cut for to give him deuce good beating when he did come. But I's is such a fool that I hadn't the heart after all. He looks so very poorly. Eh? What? Ah, yes. Upon the whole, I think you had better not be too severe with the poor fellow. Don't flog him, Jupiter. He can't very well stand it. But can you form no idea of what has occasioned this illness, or rather this change of conduct? Has anything unpleasant happened since I saw you? No, Massa. Dey ain't been nothing unpleasant since then. "'Twas for den, I'm feared. "'Twas de bare day you was dare. "'How? What do you mean?' "'Why, massa, I mean de bug. "'Dare now.' "'The what?' "'De bug. "'I'm bare certain de massa will "'been bit somewhere about the head by that gold bug.' "'And what cause have you, Jupiter, for such a supposition?' "'Claws enough, massa, and mouth too.' I never did see such a deuced bug. He kick and he bite every ting what come near him. Massa will catch him first, but he had for to let him go again mighty quick, I tell you. Then was the time he must have got to bite. I didn't like the look of the bug mouth myself, no how, so I wouldn't take hold of him with my finger, but I catch him with a piece of paper that I found. I wrap him up in the paper and stuff a piece of it in his mouth. That was the way. And you think, then? that your master was really bitten by the beetle, and that the bite made him sick? I don't think nothing about it. I knows it. What make him dream about the gold so much, if it ain't cause he bit by the gold bug? I's hear about them gold bugs for this. But how do you know he dreams about gold? How I know? Why? Cause he talk about it in his sleep. That's how I knows. Well, Jupe, perhaps you are right. But to what fortunate circumstance am I to attribute the honor of a visit from you today? What de madam, massa? Did you bring any message from Mr. Legrand? 
No, massa, I bring dis here pistol. And here Jupiter handed me a note, which ran thus. My dear, why have I not seen you for so long a time? I hope you have not been so foolish as to take offense at any little brusquerie of mine. But no, that is improbable. Since I saw you, I have had great cause for anxiety. I have something to tell you, yet scarcely know how to tell it, or whether I should tell it at all. I have not been quite well for some days past, and poor old Jupe annoys me almost beyond endurance by his well-meant attentions. Would you believe it? He had prepared a huge stick the other day, with which to chastise me for giving him the slip, and spending the day, solus, among the hills on the mainland. I verily believe that my ill looks alone saved me a flogging. I have made no addition to my cabinet since we met. If you can, in any way, make it convenient, come over with Jupiter. Do come. I wish to see you tonight, upon business of importance. I assure you that it is of the highest importance. Ever yours, William Legrand. There was something in the tone of this note which gave me great uneasiness. Its whole style differed materially from that of Legrand. What could he be dreaming of? What new crotchet possessed his excitable brain? What business of the highest importance could he possibly have to transact? Jupiter's account of him boded no good. I dreaded lest the continued pressure of misfortune had, at length, fairly unsettled the reason of my friend. Without a moment's hesitation, therefore, I prepared to accompany the negro. Upon reaching the wharf, I noticed a scythe and three spades, all apparently new, lying in the bottom of the boat in which we were to embark. "'What is the meaning of all this, Jupe?' I inquired. "'Him scythe, massa, and spade.' "'Very true, but what are they doing here?' "'Him de scythe and de spade what massa will sis pon me buying for him in de town, and de devil's own lot of money I had to give for him. "'But what?' In the name of all that is mysterious, is your massa will going to do with scythes and spades? That's more than I know, and devil take me if I don't believe tis more than he know too. But it's all come to bug. Finding that no satisfaction was to be obtained of Jupiter, whose whole intellect seemed to be absorbed by de bug, I now stepped into the boat and made sail. With a fair and strong breeze we soon ran into the little cove to the northward of Fort Moultrie, and a walk of some two miles brought us to the hut. It was about three in the afternoon when we arrived. Legrand had been awaiting us in eager expectation. He grasped my hand with a nervous empressement, which alarmed me, and strengthened the suspicions already entertained. His countenance was pale even to ghastliness, and his deep-set eyes glared with unnatural luster. After some inquiries respecting his health, I asked him, not knowing what better to say, if he had yet obtained the scarabaeus from Lieutenant G. Oh, yes, he replied, coloring violently. I got it from him the next morning. Nothing should tempt me to part with that scarabaeus. Do you know that Jupiter is quite right about it? In what way, I asked, with a sad foreboding at heart. In supposing it to be a bug of real gold. He said this with an air of profound seriousness, and I felt inexpressibly shocked. This bug is to make my fortune, he continued, with a triumphant smile, to reinstate me in my family possessions. Is it any wonder, then, that I prize it? Since fortune has thought fit to bestow it upon me, I have only to use it properly, and I shall arrive at the gold of which it is the index. Jupiter, bring me that scarabaeus. What? De bug, massa? I'd rather not go for trouble, that bug. You must get him for your own self. Hereupon Legrand arose, with a grave and stately air, and brought me the beetle from a glass case in which it was enclosed. It was a beautiful scarabaeus, and, at that time, unknown to naturalists. Of course, a great prize in a scientific point of view. There were two round black spots near one extremity of the back, and a long one near the other. The scales were exceedingly hard and glossy with all the appearance of burnished gold. The weight of the insect was very remarkable, and, taking all things into consideration, I could hardly blame Jupiter for his opinion respecting it. But what to make of Legrand's concordance with that opinion, I could not for the life of me tell. I sent for you, said he, in a grandiloquent tone, when I had completed my examination of the beetle, 
I sent for you that I might have your counsel and assistance in furthering the views of fate and of the bug. My dear Legrand, I cried, interrupting him, you are certainly unwell and had better use some little precautions. You shall go to bed, and I will remain with you a few days until you get over this. You are feverish, and... Feel my pulse, said he. I felt it, and, to say the truth, found not the slightest indication of fever. But you may be ill, and yet have no fever. Allow me this once to prescribe for you. In the first place, go to bed. In the next... You are mistaken, he interposed. I am as well as I can expect to be under the excitement which I suffer. If you really wish me well, you will relieve this excitement. And how is this to be done? Very easily. Jupiter and myself are going upon an expedition into the hills, upon the mainland, and, in this expedition, we shall need the aid of some person in whom we can confide. You are the only one we can trust. Whether we succeed or fail, the excitement which you now perceive in me will be equally allayed. I'm anxious to oblige you in any way, I replied. But do you mean to say that this infernal beetle has any connection with your expedition into the hills? It has. Then, Legrand, I can become a party to no such absurd proceeding. I am sorry, very sorry, for we shall have to try it by ourselves. Try it by yourselves? The man is surely mad, but stay. How long do you propose to be absent? Probably all night. We shall start immediately, and be back, at all events, by sunrise. And will you promise me, upon your honor, that when this freak of yours is over, and the bug business, good God, settled to your satisfaction, you will then return home and follow my advice implicitly as that of your physician? Yes, I promise. And now let us be off for we have no time to lose. With a heavy heart, I accompanied my friend. We started about four o'clock, Legrand, Jupiter, the dog, and myself. Jupiter had with him the scythe and spades, the whole of which he insisted upon carrying, more through fear, it seemed to me, of trusting either of the implements within reach of his master than from any excess of industry or complaisance. His demeanor was dogged in the extreme, and that deuced bug were the sole words which escaped his lips during the journey. For my own part, I had charge of a couple of dark lanterns, while Legrand contented himself with a scarabaeus, which he carried attached to the end of a bit of whipcord, twirling it to and fro with the air of a conjurer as he went. When I observed this last plain evidence of my friend's aberration of mind, I could scarcely refrain from tears. I thought it best, however, to humor his fancy, at least for the present, or until I could adopt some more energetic measures with a chance of success. In the meantime I endeavored, but all in vain, to sound him in regard to the object of the expedition. Having succeeded in inducing me to accompany him, he seemed unwilling to hold conversation upon any topic of minor importance, and to all my questions vouchsafed no other reply than, We shall see! We crossed the creek at the head of the island by means of a skiff, and, ascending the high grounds on the shore of the mainland, proceeded in a northwesterly direction, through a tract of country excessively wild and desolate, where no trace of a human footstep was to be seen. Legrand led the way with decision, pausing only for an instant here and there to consult what appeared to be certain landmarks of his own contrivance upon a former occasion. In this manner we journeyed for about two hours and the sun was just setting when we entered a region infinitely more dreary than any yet seen. It was a species of tableland, near the summit of an almost inaccessible hill, densely wooded from base to pinnacle, and interspersed with huge crags that appeared to lie loosely upon the soil, and in many cases were prevented from precipitating themselves into the valleys below, merely by the support of the trees against which they reclined. Deep ravines in various directions gave an air of still sterner solemnity to the scene. The natural platform to which we had clambered was thickly overgrown with brambles, through which we soon discovered that it would have been impossible to force our way, but for the scythe, and Jupiter, by direction of his master, proceeded to clear for us a path to the foot of an enormously tall tulip tree, which stood, with some eight or ten oaks, upon the level, and far surpassed them all, 
and all other trees which I had then ever seen, in the beauty of its foliage and form, in the wide spread of its branches, and in the general majesty of its appearance. When we reached this tree, Legrand turned to Jupiter, and asked him if he thought he could climb it. The old man seemed a little staggered by the question, and for some moments made no reply. At length he approached the huge trunk, walked slowly around it, and examined it with minute attention. When he had completed his scrutiny, he merely said, Yes, massa, Jupe climb any tree he ever see in he life. Then up with you as soon as possible, for it will soon be too dark to see what we are about. How far must go up, massa? inquired Jupiter. Get up the main trunk first, and then I will tell you which way to go. And here, stop. Take this beetle with you. De bug, massa Will. De gold bug, cried the negro, drawing back in dismay. What for must tote de bug way up de tree? Damned if I do. If you are afraid, Jupe, a great big negro like you, to take hold of a harmless little dead beetle, why, you can carry it up by this string. But, if you do not take it up with you in some way, I shall be under the necessity of breaking your head with this shovel. What de matter now, massa? said Jupe evidently shamed into compliance. Always want for to raise fuss wid de old nigger. Was only funnin' anyhow. Me fear de bug. What I care for de bug. Here he took cautiously hold of the extreme end of the string, and, maintaining the insect as far from his person as circumstances would permit, prepared to ascend the tree. In youth, the tulip tree, or Liriodendron tulipiferum, the most magnificent of American foresters has a trunk peculiarly smooth, and often rises to a great height without lateral branches. But, in its riper age, the bark becomes gnarled and uneven, while many short limbs make their appearance on the stem. Thus the difficulty of ascension, in the present case, lay more in semblance than in reality. Embracing the huge cylinder, as closely as possible, with his arms and knees, seizing with his hands some projections, and resting his naked toes upon others, Jupiter, after one or two narrow escapes from falling, at length wriggled himself into the first great fork, and seemed to consider the whole business as virtually accomplished. The risk of the achievement was, in fact, now over, although the climber was some sixty or seventy feet from the ground. "'Which way must go now, Massa Will?' he asked. "'Keep up the largest branch, the one on this side,' said Legrand. The negro obeyed him promptly, and apparently with but little trouble, ascending higher and higher, until no glimpse of his squat figure could be obtained through the dense foliage which enveloped it. Presently his voice was heard in a sort of halloo. "'How much further has got for go?' "'How high up are you?' asked Legrand. "'Ever so fur,' replied the negro. "'Can see the sky through the top of the tree.' "'Never mind the sky, but attend to what I say.' Look down the trunk and count the limbs below you on this side. How many limbs have you passed? One, two, three, four, five. I done pass five big limb, massa, upon this side. Then go one limb higher. In a few minutes the voice was heard again, announcing that the seventh limb was attained. Now jupe, cried Legrand, evidently much excited. I want you to work your way out upon that limb as far as you can. If you see anything strange, let me know. By this time, what little doubt I might have entertained of my poor friend's insanity was put finally at rest. I had no alternative but to conclude him stricken with lunacy, and I became seriously anxious about getting him home. While I was pondering upon what was best to be done, Jupiter's voice was again heard. Most feared for to venture upon this limb very far. Tis dead limb putty much all the way. Did you say it was a dead limb, Jupiter? cried Legrand in a quavering voice. Yes, massa, him dead as de doornail, done up for certain, done to part dis here life. What in the name of heaven shall I do? asked Legrand, seemingly in the greatest distress. Do, said I, glad of an opportunity to interpose a word. Why, come home and go to bed. Come now, that's a fine fellow. It's getting late, and besides, you remember your promise. Jupiter, cried he, without heeding me in the least. Do you hear me? Yes, Massa Will, hear you ever so plain. Try the wood well, then, with your knife, and see if you think it very rotten. 
Him rotten, massa, sure enough, replied the negro in a few moments. But not so berry rotten as ma be. Ma venture out little way pawn de limb by myself. That's true. By yourself? What do you mean? Why, I mean de bug. T is berry heavy bug. Suppose I drop him down first, and den de limb won't break with dust the way to one nigger. You infernal scoundrel, cried Legrand, apparently much relieved. What do you mean by telling me such nonsense as that? As sure as you drop that beetle, I'll break your neck. Look here, Jupiter. Do you hear me? Yes, massa. Needn't holler at poor nigger that style. Well, now listen. If you will venture out on the limb as far as you think safe, and not let go the beetle, I'll make you a present of a silver dollar as soon as you get down. I'm gwine, Master Will. Deed I is, replied the negro very promptly. Most out to the end now. Out to the end? Here fairly screamed Legrand. Do you say you are out to the end of that limb? Soon be to the end, Massa. Ooh, Lord Gaul, a mercy. What is dis here pond de tree? Well, cried Legrand, highly delighted. What is it? Why, it ain't nothing but a skull. Somebody been left him head up de tree, and de crows done gobble every bit of de meat off. A skull, you say? Very well. How is it fastened to the limb? What holds it on? Sure enough, massa. Must look. Why, dis very curious circumstance, pon my word. There's a great big nail in de skull. What fastens ob it on to de tree? Well now, Jupiter, do exactly as I tell you. Do you hear? Yes, massa. Pay attention, then. Find the left eye of the skull. Hum, ho, that's good. Why, it ain't no left eye at all. Curse your stupidity. Do you know your right hand from your left? Yes, I knows dat. Knows all about dat. Tis my left hand what I chops de wood with. To be sure, you are left-handed, and your left eye is on the same side as your left hand. Now, I suppose, you can find the left eye of the skull, or the place where the left eye has been. Have you found it? Here was a long pause. At length the negro asked, Is the left eye of the skull pon the same side as the left hand of the skull too? Cause the skull ain't got not a bit of a hand at all. Never mind, I got the left eye now. Here the left eye, what must do with it? Let the beetle drop through it, as far as the string will reach. But be careful, and not let go your hold of the string. All that done, Massa Will. Mighty easy thing for to put the bug through the hole. Look out for him there below. During this colloquy, no portion of Jupiter's person could be seen, but the beetle, which he had suffered to descend, was now visible at the end of the string, and glistened like a globe of burnished gold in the last rays of the setting sun, some of which still faintly illuminated the eminence upon which we stood. The scarabaeus hung quite clear of any branches, and, if allowed to fall, would have fallen at our feet. Legrand immediately took the scythe, and cleared with it a circular space, three or four yards in diameter, just beneath the insect, and, having accomplished this, ordered Jupiter to let go the string and come down from the tree. Driving a peg, with great nicety, into the ground, at the precise spot where the beetle fell, my friend now produced from his pocket a tape measure. Fastening one end of this at that point of the trunk of the tree, which was nearest the peg, he unrolled it till it reached the peg, and thence further unrolled it, in the direction already established by the two points of the tree and the peg, for the distance of fifty feet, Jupiter clearing away the brambles with the scythe. At the spot thus attained a second peg was driven, and about this, as a center, a rude circle, about four feet in diameter, described. Taking now a spade himself, and giving one to Jupiter and one to me, Legrand begged us to set about digging as quickly as possible. To speak the truth, I had no especial relish for such amusement at any time, and at that particular moment would most willingly have declined it, for the night was coming on, and I felt much fatigued with the exercise already taken. But I saw no mode of escape, and was fearful of disturbing my poor friend's equanimity by a refusal. Could I have depended, indeed, upon Jupiter's aid, I would have had no hesitation in attempting to get the lunatic home by force, but I was too well assured of the old negro's disposition 
to hope that he would assist me under any circumstances in a personal contest with his master. I made no doubt that the latter had been infected with some of the innumerable southern superstitions about money buried, and that his fantasy had received confirmation by the finding of the scarabaeus, or perhaps by Jupiter's obstinacy in maintaining it to be a bug of real gold. A mind disposed to lunacy would readily be led away by such suggestions, especially if chiming in with favorite preconceived ideas. And then I called to mind the poor fellow's speech about the beetles being the index of his fortune. Upon the whole, I was sadly vexed and puzzled, but at length I concluded to make a virtue of necessity, to dig with a good will, and thus the sooner to convince the visionary, by ocular demonstration, of the fallacy of the opinions he entertained. The lanterns having been lit, we all fell to work with a zeal worthy a more rational cause, and, as the glare fell upon our persons and implements, I could not help thinking how picturesque a group we composed, and how strange and suspicious our labors must have appeared to any interloper who, by chance, might have stumbled upon our whereabouts. We dug very steadily for two hours. Little was said, and our chief embarrassment lay in the yelpings of the dog, who took exceeding interest in our proceedings. He, at length, became so obstreperous that we grew fearful of his giving the alarm to some stragglers in the vicinity, or, rather, this was the apprehension of Legrand. For myself, I should have rejoiced at any interruption which might have enabled me to get the wanderer home. The noise was, at length, very effectually silenced by Jupiter, who, getting out of the hole with a dogged air of deliberation, tied the brute's mouth up with one of his suspenders, and then returned with a grave chuckle to his task. When the time mentioned had expired, we had reached a depth of five feet, and yet no signs of any treasure became manifest. A general pause ensued, and I began to hope that the farce was at an end. Legrand, however, although evidently much disconcerted, wiped his brow thoughtfully and recommenced. We had excavated the entire circle of four feet diameter, and now we slightly enlarged the limit, and went to the farther depth of two feet. Still nothing appeared. The gold seeker, whom I sincerely pitied, at length clambered from the pit, with the bitterest disappointment imprinted upon every feature, and proceeded, slowly and reluctantly, to put on his coat, which he had thrown off at the beginning of his labor. In the meantime I made no remark. Jupiter, at a signal from his master, began to gather up his tools. This done, and the dog having been unmuzzled, we turned in profound silence toward home. We had taken, perhaps, a dozen steps in this direction, when, with a loud oath, Legrand strode up to Jupiter and seized him by the collar. The astonished negro opened his eyes and mouth to the fullest extent, let fall the spades, and fell upon his knees. "'You scoundrel!' said Legrand, hissing out the syllables from between his clenched teeth. "'You infernal black villain! Speak, I tell you! Answer me this instant without prevarication! Which, which is your left eye?' "'Oh, my golly, Massa Will! Ain't dis here my left eye for certain?' roared the terrified Jupiter, placing his hand upon his right organ of vision and holding it there with a desperate pertinacity as if in immediate dread of his master's attempt at a gouge. "'I thought so! I knew it! Hurrah!' vociferated Legrand, letting the negro go, and executing a series of curvettes and caracals, much to the astonishment of his valet, who, arising from his knees, looked mutely from his master to myself, and then from myself to his master. "'Come! We must go back!' said the latter. "'The game's not up yet and he again led the way to the tulip tree. Jupiter, said he, when we reached its foot, come here. Was the skull nailed to the limb with the face outward, or with the face to the limb? The face was out, massa, so that the crows could get at the eyes good, without any trouble. Well, then, was it this eye or that through which you dropped the beetle? Here Legrand touched each of Jupiter's eyes. T'was dis eye, massa, de left eye just as you tell me. And here it was, his right eye that the negro indicated. That will do. We must try it again. Here my friend, about whose madness I now saw, or fancied that I saw, certain indications of method, removed the peg which marked the spot where the beetle fell, 
to a spot about three inches to the westward of its former position. Taking now the tape measure from the nearest point of the trunk to the peg, as before, and continuing the extension in a straight line to the distance of fifty feet, a spot was indicated, removed by several yards from the point at which we had been digging. Around the new position a circle, somewhat larger than in the former instance, was now described, and we again set to work with the spade. I was dreadfully weary, but scarcely understanding what had occasioned the change in my thoughts, I felt no longer any great aversion from the labor imposed. I had become most unaccountably interested, nay, even excited. Perhaps there was something, amid all the extravagant demeanor of Legrand, some air of forethought, or of deliberation, which impressed me. I dug eagerly, and now and then caught myself actually looking, with something that very much resembled expectation for the fancied treasure, the vision of which had demented my unfortunate companion. At a period when such vagaries of thought most fully possessed me, and when we had been at work perhaps an hour and a half, we were again interrupted by the violent howlings of the dog. His uneasiness, in the first instance, had been, evidently, but the result of playfulness or caprice, but he now assumed a bitter and serious tone. Upon Jupiter's again attempting to muzzle him, he made furious resistance, and, leaping into the hole, tore up the mold frantically with his claws. In a few seconds he had uncovered a mass of human bones, forming two complete skeletons, intermingled with several buttons of metal, and what appeared to be the dust of decayed woolen. One or two strokes of a spade upturned the blade of a large Spanish knife, and, as we dug farther, three or four loose pieces of gold and silver coin came to light. At sight of these the joy of Jupiter could scarcely be restrained, but the countenance of his master wore an air of extreme disappointment. He urged us, however, to continue our exertions, and the words were hardly uttered when I stumbled and fell forward, having caught the toe of my boot in a large ring of iron that lay half buried in the loose earth. We now worked in earnest, and never did I pass ten minutes of more intense excitement. During this interval we had fairly unearthed an oblong chest of wood, which, from its perfect preservation and wonderful hardness, had plainly been subjected to some mineralizing process, perhaps that of the bichloride of mercury. This box was three feet and a half long, three feet broad, and two and a half feet deep. It was firmly secured by bands of wrought iron, riveted, and forming a kind of open trellis work over the hole. On each side of the chest, near the top, were three rings of iron, six in all, by means of which a firm hold could be obtained by six persons. Our utmost united endeavors served only to disturb the coffer very slightly in its bed. We at once saw the impossibility of removing so great a weight. Luckily, the sole fastenings of the lid consisted of two sliding bolts. These we drew back, trembling and panting with anxiety. In an instant, a treasure of incalculable value lay gleaming before us. As the rays of the lanterns fell within the pit, there flashed upward a glow and a glare from a confused heap of gold and of jewels that absolutely dazzled our eyes. I shall not pretend to describe the feelings with which I gazed. Amazement was, of course, predominant. Legrand appeared exhausted with excitement and spoke very few words. Jupiter's countenance wore, for some minutes, as deadly a pallor as it is possible, in the nature of things, for any negro's visage to assume. He seemed stupefied, thunder-stricken. Presently he fell upon his knees in the pit, and burying his naked arms up to the elbows in gold, let them there remain, as if enjoying the luxury of a bath. At length, with a deep sigh, he exclaimed, as if in soliloquy, And dis all come at a gold bug, de purty gold bug, de poor little gold bug, what I boost in dat savage kind of style. Ain't you shamed of yourself, nigger? Answer me dat. It became necessary, at last, that I should arouse both master and valet to the expediency of removing the treasure. It was growing late, and it behooved us to make exertion that we might get everything housed before daylight. It was difficult to say what should be done, and much time was spent in deliberation, so confused were the ideas of all. We, finally, lightened the box by removing two-thirds of its contents, when we were enabled, with some trouble, 
to raise it from the hole. The articles taken out were deposited among the brambles, and the dog left to guard them, with strict orders from Jupiter, neither upon any pretense to stir from the spot, nor to open his mouth until our return. We then hurriedly made for home with the chest, reaching the hut in safety, but after excessive toil, at one o'clock in the morning. Worn out as we were, it was not in human nature to do more immediately. We rested until two, and had supper, starting for the hills immediately afterward, armed with three stout sacks, which, by good luck, were upon the premises. A little before four, we arrived at the pit, divided the remainder of the booty, as equally as might be, among us, and, leaving the holes unfilled, again set out for the hut, at which, for the second time, we deposited our golden burthens, just as the first faint streaks of the dawn gleamed from over the treetops in the east. We were now thoroughly broken down, but the intense excitement of the time denied us repose. After an unquiet slumber of three or four hours' duration, we arose, as if by pre-concert, to make examination of our treasure. The chest had been full to the brim, and we spent the whole day, and the greater part of the next night, in a scrutiny of its contents. There had been nothing like order or arrangement. Everything had been heaped in promiscuously. Having assorted all with care, we found ourselves possessed of even vaster wealth than we had at first supposed. In coin there was rather more than four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, estimating the value of the pieces, as accurately as we could, by the tables of the period. There was not a particle of silver, all was gold of antique date, and of great variety. French, Spanish, and German money, with a few English guineas, and some counters, of which we had never seen specimens before. There were several very large and heavy coins, so worn that we could make nothing of their inscriptions. There was no American money. The value of the jewels we found more difficulty in estimating. There were diamonds, some of them exceedingly large and fine, a hundred and ten in all, and not one of them small, eighteen rubies of remarkable brilliancy, three hundred and ten emeralds, all very beautiful, and twenty-one sapphires, with an opal. These stones had all been broken from their settings and thrown loose in the chest. The settings themselves, which we picked out from among the other gold, appeared to have been beaten up with hammers, as if to prevent identification. Besides all this, there was a vast quantity of solid gold ornaments, nearly two hundred massive finger and earrings, rich chains, thirty of these, if I remember, eighty-three very large and heavy crucifixes, five gold censers of great value, a prodigious golden punch bowl, ornamented with richly chased vine leaves and bacchanalian figures, with two sword handles exquisitely embossed, and many other smaller articles which I cannot recollect. The weight of these valuables exceeded three hundred and fifty pounds of voir de poix, and in this estimate I have not included one hundred and ninety-seven superb gold watches, three of the number being worth each five hundred dollars if one. Many of them were very old, and as timekeepers valueless, the works having suffered more or less from corrosion, but all were richly jeweled and in cases of great worth. We estimated the entire contents of the chest that night at a million and a half of dollars, and upon the subsequent disposal of the trinkets and jewels, a few being retained for our own use, it was found that we had greatly undervalued the treasure. When, at length, we had concluded our examination, and the intense excitement of the time had, in some measure, subsided, Legrand, who saw that I was dying with impatience for a solution of this most extraordinary riddle, entered into a full detail of all the circumstances connected with it. You remember, said he, the night when I handed you the rough sketch I had made of this scarabaeus. You recollect also that I became quite vexed at you for insisting that my drawing resembled a death's head. When you first made this assertion, I thought you were jesting, but afterward I called to mind the peculiar spots on the back of the insect, and admitted to myself that your remark had some little foundation in fact. Still, the sneer at my graphic powers irritated me, for I am considered a good artist, and, therefore, when you handed me the scrap of parchment, I was about to crumple it up and throw it angrily into the fire. The scrap of paper, you mean, said I. No, it had much of the appearance of paper, and at first I supposed it to be such, but when I came to draw upon it, I discovered it at once to be a piece of very thin parchment. It was quite dirty, you remember. Well, as I was in the very act of crumpling it up, my glance fell upon the sketch at which you had been looking, and you may imagine my astonishment when I perceived, in fact, the figure of a death's head just where, it seemed to me, I had made the drawing of the beetle. 
for a moment i was too much amazed to think with accuracy i knew that my design was very different in detail from this although there was a certain similarity in general outline presently i took a candle and seating myself at the other end of the room proceeded to scrutinize the parchment more closely upon turning it over i saw my own sketch upon the reverse just as i had made it my first idea now was mere surprise at the really remarkable similarity of outline at the singular coincidence involved in the fact that unknown to me there should have been a skull upon the other side of the parchment immediately beneath my figure of the scarabaeus and that this skull not only in outline but in size should so closely resemble my drawing i say the singularity of this coincidence absolutely stupefied me for a time this is the usual effect of such coincidences the mind struggles to establish a connection a sequence of cause and effect and being unable to do so suffers a species of temporary paralysis but when i recovered from this stupor there dawned upon me gradually a conviction which startled me even far more than the coincidence i began distinctly positively to remember that there had been no drawing upon the parchment when i made my sketch of the scarabaeus i became perfectly certain of this for i recollected turning up first one side and then the other in search of the cleanest spot had the skull been then there of course i could not have failed to notice it here was indeed a mystery which i felt it impossible to explain but even at that early moment there seemed to glimmer faintly within the most remote and secret chambers of my intellect a glow-worm-like conception of that truth which last night's adventure brought to so magnificent a demonstration i arose at once and putting the parchment securely away dismissed all further reflection until i should be alone when you had gone and when jupiter was fast asleep i betook myself to a more methodical investigation of the affair in the first place i considered the manner in which the parchment had come into my possession the spot where we discovered the scarabaeus was on the coast of the mainland about a mile eastward of the island and but a short distance above high water mark upon my taking hold of it it gave me a sharp bite which caused me to let it drop jupiter with his accustomed caution before seizing the insect which had flown toward him looked about him for a leaf or something of that nature by which to take hold of it it was at this moment that his eyes and mine also fell upon the scrap of parchment which i then supposed to be paper it was lying half buried in the sand a corner sticking up near the spot where we found it i observed the remnants of the hull of what appeared to have been a ship's longboat the wreck seemed to have been there for a very great while for the resemblance to boat timbers could scarcely be traced well jupiter picked up the parchment wrapped the beetle in it and gave it to me soon afterward we turned to go home and on the way met lieutenant g i showed him the insect and he begged me to let him take it to the fort upon my consenting he thrust it forthwith into his waistcoat pocket without the parchment in which it had been wrapped and which i had continued to hold in my hand during his inspection perhaps he dreaded my changing my mind and thought it best to make sure of the prize at once you know how enthusiastic he is on all subjects connected with natural history at the same time without being conscious of it i must have deposited the parchment in my own pocket you remember that when i went to the table for the purpose of making a sketch of the beetle i found no paper where it was usually kept i looked in the drawer and found none there i searched my pockets hoping to find an old letter when my hand fell upon the parchment i thus detail the precise mode in which it came into my possession for the circumstances impressed me with peculiar force no doubt you will think me fanciful but i had already established a kind of connection i had put together two links of a great chain there was a boat lying upon a sea coast and not far from the boat was a parchment not a paper with a skull depicted upon it you will of course ask where is the connection i replied that the skull or death's head is the well-known emblem of the pirate the flag of the death's head is hoisted in all engagements i have said that the scrap was parchment and not paper parchment is durable almost imperishable matters of little moment are rarely consigned to parchment since for the mere ordinary purposes of drawing or writing it is not nearly so well adapted as paper this reflection suggested some meaning some relevancy in the death's head i did not fail to observe also the form of the parchment although one of its corners had been by some accident destroyed it could be seen that the original form was oblong it was just such a slip indeed as might have been chosen for a memorandum for a record of something to be long remembered and carefully preserved but i interposed you say that the skull was not upon the parchment when you made the drawing of the beetle how then do you trace any connection between the boat and the skull since this latter according to your own admission must have been designed god only knows how or by whom at some period subsequent to your sketching the scarabaeus ah hereupon turns the whole mystery although the secret at this point i had comparatively little difficulty in solving 
my steps were sure and could afford but a single result i reasoned for example thus when i drew the scarabaeus there was no skull apparent upon the parchment when i had completed the drawing i gave it to you and observed you narrowly until you returned it you therefore did not design the skull and no one else was present to do it then it was not done by human agency and nevertheless it was done at this stage of my reflections i endeavored to remember and did remember with entire distinctness every incident which occurred about the period in question the weather was chilly oh rare and happy accident and a fire was blazing upon the hearth i was heated with exercise and sat near the table you however had drawn a chair close to the chimney just as i placed the parchment in your hand and as you were in the act of inspecting it wolf the newfoundland entered and leaped upon your shoulders with your left hand you caressed him and kept him off while your right holding the parchment was permitted to fall listlessly between your knees and in close proximity to the fire at one moment i thought the blaze had caught it and was about to caution you but before i could speak you had withdrawn it and were engaged in its examination when i considered all these particulars i doubted not for a moment that heat had been the agent in bringing to light upon the parchment the skull which i saw designed upon it you are well aware that chemical preparations exist and have existed time out of mind by means of which it is possible to write upon either paper or vellum so that the characters shall become visible only when subjected to the action of fire zafre digested in aqua regia and diluted with four times its weight of water is sometimes employed a green tint results the regulus of cobalt dissolved in spirit of nitre gives a red these colors disappear at longer or shorter intervals after the material written upon cools but again become apparent upon the reapplication of heat i now scrutinized the death's head with care its outer edges the edges of the drawing nearest the edge of the vellum were far more distinct than the others it was clear that the action of the caloric had been imperfect or unequal i immediately kindled a fire and subjected every portion of the parchment to a glowing heat at first the only effect was the strengthening of the faint lines in the skull but upon persevering in the experiment there became visible at the corner of the slip diagonally opposite to the spot in which the death's head was delineated the figure of what i at first supposed to be a goat a closer scrutiny however satisfied me that it was intended for a kid ha ha said i to be sure i have no right to laugh at you a million and a half of money is too serious a matter for mirth but you are not about to establish a third link in your chain you will not find any especial connection between your pirates and a goat pirates you know have nothing to do with goats they appertain to the farming interest but i have just said that the figure was not that of a goat well a kid then pretty much the same thing pretty much but not altogether said legrand you may have heard of one captain kid i at once looked upon the figure of the animal as a kind of punning or hieroglyphical signature i say signature because its position upon the vellum suggested this idea the death's head at the corner diagonally opposite had in the same manner the air of a stamp or seal but i was sorely put out by the absence of all else of the body to my imagined instrument of the text for my context i presume you expected to find a letter between the stamp and the signature something of that kind the fact is i felt irresistibly impressed with the presentiment of some vast good fortune impending i can scarcely say why perhaps after all it was rather a desire than an actual belief but do you know that jupiter's silly words about the bug being of solid gold had a remarkable effect upon my fancy and then the series of accidents and coincidences these were so very extraordinary do you observe how mere an accident it was that these events should have occurred upon the sole day of the, all the year in which it has been or may be sufficiently cool for fire and that without the fire or without the intervention of the dog at the precise moment in which he appeared i should never have become aware of the death's head and so never the possessor of the treasure but proceed i am all impatience well you have heard of course the many stories current the thousand vague rumors afloat about money buried somewhere upon the atlantic coast by kidd and his associates these rumors must have had some foundation in fact and that the rumors have existed so long and so continuous could have resulted it appeared to me only from the circumstance of the buried treasure still remaining entombed had kidd concealed his plunder for a time and afterward reclaimed it the rumors would scarcely have reached us in their present unvarying form you will observe that the stories told are all about money seekers not money finders had the pirate recovered his money there the affair would have dropped 
it seemed to me that some accident say the loss of a memorandum indicating its locality had deprived him of the means of recovering it and that this accident had become known to his followers who otherwise might never have heard that treasure had been concealed at all and who busying themselves in vain because unguided attempts to regain it had given first birth and then universal currency to the reports which are now so common have you ever heard of any important treasure being unearthed along the coast never but that kids accumulations were immense is well known i took it for granted therefore that the earth still held them and you will scarcely be surprised when i tell you that i felt a hope nearly amounting to certainty that the parchment so strangely found involved a lost record of the place of deposit but how did you proceed i held the vellum again to the fire after increasing the heat but nothing appeared i now thought it possible that the coating of dirt might have something to do with the failure so i carefully rinsed the parchment by pouring warm water over it and having done this i placed it in a tin pan with the skull downward and put the pan upon a furnace of lighted charcoal in a few minutes the pan having become thoroughly heated i removed the slip and to my inexpressible joy found it spotted in several places with what appeared to be figures arranged in lines again i placed it in the pan and suffered it to remain another minute upon taking it off the hole was just as you see it now here legrand having reheated the parchment submitted it to my inspection the following characters were rudely traced in a red tint between the death's head and the goat five three etc three zero five six etc etc four eight zero eight one semicolon eight and so on and so on but said i returning him the slip i am as much in the dark as ever were all the jewels of golconda awaiting me upon my solution of this enigma i am quite sure that i should be unable to earn them and yet said legrand the solution is by no means so difficult as you might be led to imagine from the first hasty inspection of the characters these characters as any one might readily guess form a cipher that is to say they convey a meaning but then from what is known of kid i could not suppose him capable of constructing any of the more abstruse cryptographs i made up my mind at once that this was of a simple species such however as would appear to the crude intellect of the sailor absolutely insoluble without the key and you really solved it readily i have solved others of an abstruseness ten thousand times greater circumstances and a certain bias of mind have led me to take interest in such riddles and it may well be doubted whether human ingenuity can construct an enigma of the kind which human ingenuity may not by proper application resolve in fact having once established connected and legible characters i scarcely gave a thought to the mere difficulty of developing their import in the present case indeed in all cases of secret writing the first question regards the language of the cipher for the principles of solution so far especially as the more simple ciphers are concerned depend upon and are varied by the genius of the particular idiom in general there is no alternative but experiment directed by probabilities of every tongue known to him who attempts the solution until the true one be attained but with the cipher now before us all difficulty was removed by the signature the pun upon the word kid is appreciable in no other language than the english but for this consideration i should have begun my attempts with the spanish and french as the tongues in which a secret of this kind would most naturally have been written by a pirate of the spanish main as it was i assumed the cryptograph to be english you observe there are no divisions between the words had there been divisions the task would have been comparatively easy in such cases i should have commenced with a collation and analysis of the shorter words and had a word of a single letter occurred as is most likely a or i for example i should have considered the solution as assured but there being no division my first step was to ascertain the predominant letters as well as the least frequent counting all i constructed a table thus of the character eight there are thirty three semicolon there are twenty six the number four there are nineteen and so on now in english the letter which most frequently occurs is e afterward the succession runs thus a o i d h n r s t u y c f g l m w b k p q x z e predominates so remarkably that an individual sentence of any length is rarely seen in which it is not the prevailing character here then we have in the very beginning the groundwork for something more than a mere guess the general use which may be made of the table is obvious but in this particular cipher we shall only very partially require its aid as our predominant character is eight we will commence by assuming it as the e of the natural alphabet to verify the supposition let us observe if the eight be seen often in couples 
for e is doubled with great frequency in english in such words for example as meet fleet speed seen ben agree etc in the present instance we see it doubled no less than five times although the cryptograph is brief let us assume eight then as e now of all words in the language the is most usual let us see therefore whether there are not repetitions of any three characters in the same order of collocation the last of them being eight if we discover repetitions of such letters so arranged they will most probably represent the word the upon inspection we find no less than seven such arrangements the characters being semicolon four eight we may therefore assume that semicolon represents t four represents h and eight represents e the last being now well confirmed thus a great step has been taken but having established a single word we are enabled to establish a vastly important point that is to say several commencements and terminations of other words let us refer for example to the last instance but one in which the combination semicolon four eight occurs not far from the end of the cipher we know that the semicolon immediately ensuing is the commencement of a word and of the six characters succeeding this the we are cognizant of no less than five let us set these characters down thus by the letters we know them to represent leaving a space for the unknown t space e e t h here we are enabled at once to discard the th as forming no portion of the word commencing with the first t since by experiment of the entire alphabet for a letter adapted to the vacancy we perceive that no word can be formed of which this th can be a part we are thus narrowed into t space e e and going through the alphabet if necessary as before we arrive at the word tree as the sole possible reading we thus gain another letter r represented by left parenthesis with the words the tree in juxtaposition looking beyond these words for a short distance we again see the combination semicolon four eight and employ it by way of termination to what immediately precedes we thus have this arrangement the space tree space semicolon four left parenthesis and so on or substituting the natural letters where known it reads thus the space tree space t h r and so on now if in place of the unknown characters we leave blank spaces or substitute dots we read thus the tree t h r blank 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 h space the when the word through makes itself evident at once but this discovery gives us three new letters o u and g represented by plus question mark and three looking now narrowly through the cipher for combinations of known characters we find not very far from the beginning this arrangement a three left for an eight eight or e g r e e which plainly is the conclusion of the word degree and gives us another letter d represented by the cross four letters beyond the word degree we perceive the combination semicolon four six left paren semicolon eight eight translating the known characters and representing the unknowns by dots as before we read thus t h dot r t e e an arrangement immediately suggestive of the word thirteen and again furnishing us with two new characters i and n represented by six and star referring now to the beginning of the cryptograph we find the combination five three plus plus cross dot translating as before we obtain dot good which assures us that the first letter is a and that the first two words are a uh, good it is now time that we arrange our key as far as discovered in a tabular form to avoid confusion it will stand thus five represents a cross represents d eight represents e and so on we have therefore no less than eleven of the most important letters represented and it will be unnecessary to proceed with the details of the solution i have said enough to convince you that ciphers of this nature are readily soluble and to give you some insight into the rationale of their development but be assured that the specimen before us appertains to the very simplest species of cryptograph it now only remains to give you the full translation of the characters upon the parchment as unriddled here it is a good glass in the bishop's hostel in the devil's seat forty one degrees and thirteen minutes northeast and by north main branch seventh limb east side shoot from the left eye of the death's head a bee line from the tree through the shot fifty feet out but said i the enigma seems still in as bad a condition as ever how is it possible to extort a meaning from all this jargon about devil seats death's heads and bishop's hostels i confess replied legrand that the matter still wears a serious aspect when regarded with a casual glance my first endeavor was to divide the sentence into the natural division intended by the cryptographist you mean to punctuate it 
something of that kind but how is it possible to effect this i reflected that it had been a point with the writer to run his words together without division so as to increase the difficulty of solution now a not over acute man in pursuing such an object would be nearly certain to overdo the matter when in the course of his composition he arrived at a break in his subject which would naturally require a pause or a point he would be exceedingly apt to run his characters at this place more than usually close together if you will observe the manuscript in the present instance you will easily detect five such cases of unusual crowding acting upon his hint i made the division thus a good glass in the bishop's hostel in the devil's seat forty one degrees and thirteen minutes northeast and by north main branch seventh limb east side shoot from the left eye of the death's head a bee line from the tree through the shot fifty feet out even this division said i leaves me still in the dark it left me also in the dark replied legrand for a few days during which i made diligent inquiry in the neighborhood of sullivan's island for any building which went by the name of the bishop's hotel for of course i dropped the obsolete word hostile gaining no information on the subject i was on the point of extending my sphere of search and proceeding in a more systematic manner when one morning it entered my head quite suddenly that this bishop's hostel might have been some reference to an old family of the name of bessop which time out of mind had held possession of an ancient manor house about four miles to the northward of the island i accordingly went over to the plantation and reinstituted my inquiries among the older negroes of the place at length one of the most aged of the women said that she had heard of such a place as bessop's castle and thought that she could guide me to it but that it was not a castle nor a tavern but a high rock i offered to pay her well for her trouble and after some demur she consented to accompany me to the spot we found it without much difficulty when dismissing her i proceeded to examine the place the castle consisted of an irregular assemblage of cliffs and rocks one of the latter being quite remarkable for its height as well as for its insulated and artificial appearance i clambered to its apex and then felt much at a loss as to what should be next done while i was busied in reflection my eyes fell upon a narrow ledge in the eastern face of the rock perhaps a yard below the summit upon which i stood this ledge projected about eighteen inches and was not more than a foot wide while a niche in the cliff just above it gave it a rude resemblance to one of the hollow-backed chairs used by our ancestors i made no doubt that here was the devil's seat alluded to in the manuscript and now i seemed to grasp the full secret of the riddle the good glass i knew could have reference to nothing but a telescope for the word glass is rarely employed in any other sense by seamen now here i at once saw was a telescope to be used and a definite point of view admitting no variation from which to use it nor did i hesitate to believe that the phrases forty one degrees and thirteen minutes and northeast and by north were intended as directions for the leveling of the glass greatly excited by these discoveries i hurried home procured a telescope and returned to the rock i let myself down to the ledge and found that it was impossible to retain a seat upon it except in one particular position this fact confirmed my preconceived idea i proceeded to use the glass of course the forty-one degrees and thirteen minutes could allude to nothing but elevation above the visible horizon since the horizontal direction was clearly indicated by the words northeast and by north this latter direction i at once established by means of a pocket compass then pointing the glass as nearly at an angle of forty-one degrees of elevation as i could do it by guess i moved it cautiously up or down until my attention was arrested by a circular rift or opening in the foliage of a large tree that overtopped its fellows in the distance in the centre of this rift i perceived a white spot but could not at first distinguish what it was adjusting the focus of the telescope i again looked and now made it out to be a human skull upon this discovery i was so sanguine as to consider the enigma solved for the phrase main branch seventh limb east side could refer only to the position of the skull upon the tree while shoot from the left eye of the death's head admitted also of but one interpretation in regard to a search for buried treasure i perceived that the design was to drop a bullet from the left eye of the skull and that a bee line or in other words a straight line drawn from the nearest point of the trunk through the shot or the spot where the bullet fell and thence extended to a distance of fifty feet would indicate a definite point and beneath this point i thought it at least possible that a deposit of value lay concealed all this i said is exceedingly clear and although ingenious 
still simple and explicit. When you left the bishop's hotel, what then? Why, having carefully taken the bearings of the tree, I turned homeward. The instant that I left the devil's seat, however, the circular rift vanished, nor could I get a glimpse of it afterward, turn as I would. What seems to me the chief ingenuity in this whole business is the fact, for repeated experiment has convinced me it is a fact, that the circular opening in question is visible from no other attainable point of view than that afforded by the narrow ledge upon the face of the rock. In this expedition to the bishop's hotel, I had been attended by Jupiter, who had, no doubt, observed, for some weeks past, the abstraction of my demeanor, and took especial care not to leave me alone. But, on the next day, getting up very early, I contrived to give him the slip, and went into the hills in search of the tree. After much toil I found it. When I came home at night my valet proposed to give me a flogging. With the rest of the adventure, I believe you are as well acquainted as myself. I suppose, said I, you missed the spot, in the first attempt at digging, through Jupiter's stupidity in letting the bug fall through the right instead of through the left eye of the skull. Precisely, this mistake made a difference of about two inches and a half in the shot, that is to say, in the position of the peg nearest the tree, and had the treasure been beneath shot, the error would have been of little moment, but the shot, together with the nearest point of the tree, were merely two points for the establishment of a line of direction. Of course the error, however trivial in the beginning, increased as we proceeded with the line, and by the time we had gone fifty feet threw us quite off the scent. But for my deep-seated impressions that treasure was here somewhere actually buried, we might have had all our labor in vain. But your grandiloquence, and your conduct in swinging the beetle, how excessively odd! I was sure you were mad, and why did you insist upon letting fall the bug, instead of a bullet from the skull? Why, to be frank, I felt somewhat annoyed by your evident suspicions touching my sanity, and so resolved to punish you quietly, in my own way, by a little bit of sober mystification. For this reason I swung the beetle, and for this reason I let it fall from the tree. An observation of yours about its great weight suggested the latter idea. Yes, I perceive, and now there is only one point which puzzles me. What are we to make of the skeletons found in the whole? That is a question I am no more able to answer than yourself. There seems, however, only one plausible way of accounting for them, and yet it is dreadful to believe in such atrocity as my suggestion would imply. It is clear that Kidd, if Kidd indeed secreted this treasure, which I doubt not, it is clear that he must have had assistance in the labor, but this labor concluded, he may have thought it expedient to remove all participants in his secret. Perhaps a couple of blows with a mattock were sufficient, while his coadjutors were busy in the pit. Perhaps it required a dozen, who shall tell? End of the Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe